Hey, thanks so much for tuning in to this message here on our YouTube page. Hey, I hope it blesses you and encourages you. Just want you to think about this. Uh, We view this as a supplement to your life. We don't view it as a replacement uh, to the local church. And if we can help you find a local church, we'd love to help you do that. Also, we'd love to hear how God's ministering in your life, what he's doing in your life, and testimonies about how God's using this message to grow your faith. You can email us at info at victorycity.church. And if you would, just click that subscribe button down below me. Like this video, it helps us get the word out about the good news of Jesus. And finally, if you'd love to financially support the ministry here at Victory City Church, you can go to our website, victorycity.church forward slash give. You can give there by card or even Venmo. And I know we would appreciate it to help us continue to do what we're doing. Again, thanks so much for tuning in. I hope this message encourages you. Amen. You guys can jump in, jump into your seats. We're going to jump into this. I do need to set this series up just a little bit. Um, uh, So I'm not going to be able to unpack all of the content uh, today. I kind of like to think of it uh, like this. Um, Before I can have another meal, I have to clean the plate of my past meal. Uh, and so really today is not going to be a bunch of new content as much as it's the cleaning off of sometimes our perspective and worldviews and current cultural views that we have about marriage relationships and all those types of things. Um, but, but hang with me. This is going to be a six-week series where we un- unpack those things next week. I'm going to be talking about um, uh, how to get your wife to submit to you. And um, I really am. And then also, wives, I'm going to be talking about how to get your husbands to lay down their life like Christ laid down his life to the church. So it's going to be a really good one. Uh, If you want your wife to submit, bring her next week. And if you want your husband to sacrifice, bring him next week, and it'll all be good. Amen? I think some people, I just turned some people off. It's really low. uh, And you're like, I will not submit. Um, But something has to change. I really believe that. The number one prayer request that we get in our church is about marriage. Um, Whether it's someone who is single searching for marriage, whether it's a relationship or whether it's an actual marriage where where they're struggling. And uh, marriage marriage can be massively painful uh, when it's not done right. Um, And it can be a very difficult thing. And I know if you're here and you go, well, I'm not really married, uh, uh, so, uh, you know, I'm gonna check out. Here's the thing. Man, lock in because maybe hopefully you will one day. Um, but also if you're going, man, I've kind of given my life to a life of singleness. Hey, praise God. You still need to know what marriage is uh, because you're going to have friends who are married and you're going to want to pray for them and encourage them and build them up in a godly marriage. Amen? Amen. But something has to change. Uh, we've all said this at some point in our life where we've become so emotionally exhausted. Uh, we've come to the end of our rope and we go, man, something has to change. Uh, whether it's in our finances and you look at your finances and you go, oh, something, something has to change. Uh, whether it comes to your health, you know, you're brushing your teeth in the mirror at night and more than the toothbrush is moving and you go, oh, something has to change. Um, and, uh, and especially when it comes to marriage, something has to change. We've, we've reached the point where I don't even, I don't know what to do anymore. Uh, we've, we've tried it. We've talked about it. We've stayed up till 2 a.m. We've read the books. We've uh, you know, we, we've, tr- we've tried everything we can and, and something's not working. Um, and I'm, I'm not really much for a rom-com style of uh, relationship series um, because I find them not helpful. I find them more pandering. Um, so you're, you're probably not gonna get a lot of like, hey, seven ways to have a better date night. Um, for me, I think the Bible speaks the best to our marriage because marriage was God's idea. Uh, it wasn't the government's idea. It wasn't Hollywood's idea. Uh, it wasn't De Beers, uh, Diamond is Forever. Um, it, 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 marriage was not culture's idea. It was God's idea. And I, I believe that as believers who are fully surrendered to Jesus, uh, this means that the way and path of Jesus is how we're called to build our lives. Um, uh, Jesus is not simply the foundation of our life, but Jesus is the landscaping, Jesus is the drywall, Jesus is the paint, Jesus is the two by fours, Jesus is the fixtures, he's the electric, he is everything in our life, uh, and we reside in the life that scripture and God builds around us. 
Uh, too many people think that Jesus is just the foundation and then they can build their life the way they want to because they have a really good foundation. But if you've ever driven through a rural town uh, or an old town where people have left that town, you will see foundations there but no home there. Uh, and, and I can build a terrible house on top of a really good foundation um, and the house will crumble but the foundation will stay there. And that's because a lot of people think that once I get Jesus in on the ground floor, then I can kind of do what I want. But the problem is I can have a great foundation but a terrible structure and the structure will fall. And, and a lot of people I see, they'll, they'll go, yeah, Jesus is my number one and he's their foundation. He's kind of like the bedrock. But then they go off and they try to build a marriage according to culture, not according to Christ. Um, and, and then they wonder, and they go, see, this whole Jesus thing doesn't work. And I'm like, no, 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 you kicked Jesus out like a long time ago. You just had him do the foundation, and, and he's actually a really good interior designer, and he's a really good framer, and he's a really good electrician, and he's a really good roofer, and he's wanting to build the whole structure and just have you reside in it. Amen? And so if you're here and you're not a believer, which... I know that there are people here. Uh, kind of think of it like this. Kind of think of it like you're peering through the window uh, of how Jesus people should do their marriage. And, and I hope that something in your heart is sparked and you would begin to see actually doing life according to Jesus um, is, is actually a better way. It doesn't mean that it's less painful. Uh, in fact, people come to Jesus and they think all the pain's gonna go away. No, no, uh, it's just a different pain. Um, but the results are always better. But something has to change. If you, if you look at our world, uh, divorce rates are still crazy high uh, historically. Um, they've dropped slightly, and that's only because people are just not getting married as much um, because they're writing off marriage, and uh, marriage as an institution is viewed as antiquated. Uh, critics, in fact, would say of marriage that why do you need marriage anymore? Our society has advanced to the point where marriage is an old-fashioned idea. Um, you can cohabitate. You can live together. Uh, you don't need marriage. Um, but the problem is that this, this idea is really deeply misleading because uh, statistics have shown that people still want marriage. Uh, in fact, the majority of people still want to get married, uh, even though academics and, you know, different uh, commentators will say, we don't need marriage. People, like in their heart, people still want to get married. Uh, but that being said, uh, divorce rates are still really, really high, both equally in the church and outside of the church, uh, and they continue to rise. Um, in fact, cohabitation, if you don't know what cohabitation is, cohabitation has become the norm where we live together and then we get married. Um, but the problem with that is we cohabitate to try to test drive marriage, thinking that it will help us actually have a better marriage. But statistics show that cohabitation actually leads to an increased rate of divorce. Um, not only that, uh, we cohabitate for really selfish reasons. We wanna make sure that they match our chemistry or that they're sexually compatible with what we want to do sexually. Uh, essentially, it's just saying this, will you do what I want? Um, and the problem with that is it actually is creating, creating massive, massive levels of anxiety because people in a cohabitate relationship, um, they're basically on audition for three to five years. Um, you're auditioning to be your husband, auditioning to, to be a wife. And a lot of people are scared of ultimatums, like, hey, I'm not gonna do this anymore with you. Um, so either you, like, let, let's get married or let's not. And so because of fear of losing that individual or fear of giving an ultimatum, can I just go ahead and set you free really quick? When it comes to marriage, there's no problem in an ultimatum. Uh, like, hey, you either gonna do this thing or we're gonna have to find somebody else. Um, there's, there's not a problem with that at all. Um, and the scariest, the scariest part uh, about really the, the place we find ourselves when it comes to marriage and relationships is uh, our global birth rates. Now, I know that's kind of academic and you're going, what's going on? But if you study the effects of global birth rates and if birth rates continue to drop, uh, man, civilization as you see it is in real, real dire straits. In fact, right now in America, the uh, current birth rate is 1.6, so we are not even at replacement level. Um, the average woman gives birth to 1.6 children. So if you're somebody who's a retiree or want to retire in the next 30 to 40 years, 
if we don't have a population base to support and it continues, here, here's the way uh, population birth rate drops is it's an upside down pyramid, which an upside down pyramid topples pretty quickly. Um, and I can't go into it. In fact, if you just want to have a fun afternoon and be scared, look at the effects of a declining birth rate. Uh, all this is based upon a society previously that was built on marriage. Uh, governments knew that marriage was essential to the health and prosperity of a civilization. Western culture, as we know it, and all the benefits of it, and I know it's really popular to bash Western culture, but why does everybody want to move to Western culture? It's because, it's because there is a space of prosperity. And so Western culture has its warts for sure, but it, it, it still has created a flourishing society and that flourishing society was built on the idea of marriage. And I say all these things not to depress you, um, but to rather sober you. Uh, think of it as like a strong cup of coffee after a wild Friday night. Like, Ooh, okay, we gotta wake up here because something, something has to change. And, and I can't expect culture to change unless the church changes. And, and I just believe that where the change must take place is in the house of God, in the place where God's saying, here is my plan for marriage, here is my plan for sexuality, here is my plan for dating and singleness and all the things that have to do with romantic relationships. Uh, because it's God's idea. And it must take place in the house of God, in the people of God, and the church humbly, let me say that really clearly, humbly must be the place the world looks to. We've not been so great at being humble. At times we've been very arrogant. But we must humbly be the place that the world looks to and says, what are they doing differently in their marriages and how can we learn from them? Scripture says here in Ephesians chapter 5, 31, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. Uh, this mystery is profound. Okay, I wanna pause there. They're gonna keep that on the screen. When we look at the word mystery, Paul is writing here, it doesn't mean it's unknowable. It's like a mystery and it's, it's ephemeral and it's, a, it's just like, okay, what's going on? Actual, the, the Greek word that Paul uses had multiple definitions, and that's just the one we chose for our Bible, uh, which is, is, is the most correct, but, but it has a sub-definition, which is a secret. The, this, this Greek word, can you be used for secret, meaning this secret is profound, meaning that there's a secret about the gospel that's only found in marriage. And, and I want to unpack something really quick, and, and we'll unpack it even more later, and that's this, that your marriage is the greatest living laboratory for you to understand the gospel. Okay, I want to say that again. Your marriage is, is, like, a, a, is like a classroom where you can actually live out in real tangible efforts what the gospel looks like. Okay, so before you get married, it's all theoretical. Once you get married, it's actually practical, right? Learning how to forgive someone who's hurt you sounds good in theory, but looking at your husband who's done the same thing 15 times and learning how to forgive, hanging out, that's a whole nother level. Your marriage, your marriage is, is God's laboratory for the gospel. It's, it's the, the thing that he put in place to teach humanity uh, really the felt, tangible expressions of what the gospel looks like. So if you wanna know the gospel, look to a really healthy marriage and the things that you find in that healthy marriage will be indicators of what the gospel looks like. It's like a, it's like a living example of the gospel of Jesus. More on that in just a minute. But in order for our marriages to change for the better, the first thing that has to change is how we view marriage. We view marriage. Um, unfortunately, a, a lot of us, we have certain lenses or paradigms in which we see marriage that really sets us up for failure. We have certain expectations about marriage that don't come from Scripture, but come from culture that we adopt as truth and then apply those to our marriages. And then when our marriage struggles, we go, wait a minute, why is it struggling so bad? I thought marriage was supposed to be X, Y, and Z. 
It's supposed to be like this. And I'm, I'm gonna unpack that in just a minute. But, but before I get there, I, I wanna go ahead and, and just set this up really quick. Um, anytime I talk about something as sensitive as romantic relationships, sexual expression, marriage, all those types of things, I'm undoubtedly gonna offend somebody. Uh, scripture says this, that the wounds of a friend are better than the kisses of an enemy. Uh, we have a culture that loves kisses, and we love to be kissed by our enemy, meaning uh, we have a culture that, that basically says this, God, I want you to make me a better version of me, which is totally opposite to the gospel, because the gospel is not about making you a better version of you, it's about making you a better version of Jesus, Okay, so there has to be transformation. There has to be a leaving of identity. And so just go ahead and like, I, I, I love you, but I'm probably gonna offend some of you. Please know it's done in love. I, I, I don't really like to preach to the choir. I get no benefit from that. Um, I, I'm probably not gonna get a lot of amens. If you wanna give me an amen, like I'd love it. But, um, <laughs> but that, that's really not the point of this message because I, I wanna help you more than I really want to like, rah, 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 okay, what do we do now? Because how many of you guys know you can aim, amen 17 times and go back to a terrible marriage, right? Amens don't change us um, as much as taking what I amen and apply it, that changes us, okay? You guys with me? Okay, so there's three dangerous and detrimental destructive views to marriage that uh, many of us possess. The first one is idealism, idealism. We have a hyper ideal view of marriage in our modern society. Uh, marriage, marriage used to be viewed as the thing that would civilize men. No, really, you can say amen to that, right? Uh, marriage, okay, you, you have to see this, that, that marriage used to be the path to self-mastery. You would get married and you stopped living for stupid passions and lusts and you had responsibility. If, how many guys do I have that drive a truck? Anybody drive a truck in here? Hoorah. Okay, have you guys ever pulled a trailer? Anybody ever pulled a trailer with their truck? How many guys know this? That when you pull an empty trailer, it's erratic, but as soon as you put some weight on the trailer, it drives straight. Men are like trucks and trailer. They need to pull and carry something to drive straight. Okay. Straight in multiple ways. Here's the thing. So, so what we wanna look at here is this, is we have a hyper-idealistic view of marriage. Um, because ultimately, we have something called uh, alphaism, where we want to be alpha dogs, right? Now, you may not be an alpha male, uh, but, but identify where you might be on the alpha spectrum. Um, and that is this. Here's, here's what we want. Men, here's what men want in marriage to varying degrees. Now, you may go, well, I'm, I don't, I'm not all that. Well, you probably possess some of it. Uh, men uh, want compatibility, not in a partnership. They want a wife to be compatible to their unchanged lifestyle. Okay, so what I want is I want a woman who is um, sexy. I want a woman who's intelligent. I want a woman who's funny. I want a, a woman who's emotionally secure. I want a woman who wants to, to make her own money. And also, I just want her to be a part of my life, but don't change my life. That's what, that's what men want. Don't change me. Don't try to change me. Uh, which is, it goes, is antithetical to how God designed marriage to where you would get in a union together and then over time you would grow into the man that you're called to be. Let me just go ahead and tell you, ladies, um, men, are, men, men have to be developed and grow into it. No man comes ready-made, uh, and neither do ladies. Uh, so when I say, when I say, when, remember when I talked about foundations? Um, you don't drive to a model home and then go buy the house already made. Marriage is like driving up to an open lot and building it from scratch. And the way you build it will determine uh, really the beauty of your marriage. I, I like to think of marriage like this. Marriage is brutal. 
I say it all the time, it's brutal. It is brutal and beautiful. Um, okay, so, so this hyper-idealistic view of marriage that comes from men is, hey, I want, I want a moneymaker, um, I want an adult film star in the bedroom, I want somebody who's always ready and available for me all the time, but don't change me, I'm still gonna be me. In the equal and opposite form, okay, so that's a lens that we carry. So whenever we meet a woman who's not like that, um, or we get married and suddenly she's not like that, we think something's wrong with them. Okay, ladies, um, feminism did you no favors. Feminism as a modern ideology is straight from the pit of hell. Why? It's because it's not God designed. Now, some of you, especially if you're a strong boss lady, you're gonna think, wait, no, girl power. I'm not saying that women are not valuable and precious and talented and amazing and beautiful, but the ideology of feminism is corrupt. Let me show you. Uh, Robin Morgan, a famous feminism from the 1970s, she's still alive writing today, she had this quote where she said, we cannot destroy inequities between men and women until we destroy marriage. Feminism as a movement wants to destroy the foundation and cultural pillars that Christianity has put into civilization. Now you might say, well, Eric, there's been all these atrocities done to women. Yes, there have, and we can't ignore that, and we must get better and grow and correct, but but in this situation, the solution is far greater than the problem. Let me show you why. Feminism says, I want all those things too. I want a ready-made husband, um, but don't try to fit me into a narrow gender role. Um, and the problem is women have been told this really terrible lie that until modernity, women lived gray, dull, miserable lives. Uh, which is such arrogance to look at our ancestors and to believe, oh, you were miserable until you got our knowledge. Uh, they lived beautiful, wonderful, colorful lives and lived in complete fulfillment. Does that mean that society shouldn't change and evolve and grow? Of course not. We should do that. But feminism as an idea has done more to harm women for marriage than any other philosophy up till this point. It tells you don't have kids, don't get married, focus on your career, be independent, have personal freedoms. And if you do get married, find somebody passive enough to not infringe on your personal freedoms. They say this, marry a doormat, that's where we get the word beta, uh, is an opposite to the alpha. Uh, and we're seeing this now, women who have bought into the lie of feminism, who are now in their 40s, 50s, and 60s, live with deep regret because they didn't get married, didn't start a family, even though they froze their eggs, they built a great career, they're realizing their career and their personal autonomy and their self-actualization is actually not sustaining enough for a deep, healthy soul. Women want to beat the boys at their own game. But they have beat us, and they're still deeply unhappy. Uh, men don't want a competitor. God designed men and women to complement each other. God designed men and women uniquely. They're not the same. They have their own unique design that complement one another. I love that my wife is not like me. Uh, she compliments me. Is my wife less than me? No. She is equal in value, but I play the role of the leader of our home. Um, and she'll tell you that. My wife and I are not co-pastors. Um, my wife is a pastor on the staff, but she will tell you Eric is the lead pastor. And that's because this, um, a two-headed anything is a monster. So this overreaching idealism, this lens that we view life for, I'm wanting this ready-made woman who can do everything and be everything, but don't change me. And oh, hey, girl power, I'm a girl boss, I don't need a man, I'll freeze my eggs, I'll go to a sperm bank and I have my own kid, all those types of things. Both of those have corrupted humanity to the point where it creates more anxiety level, more depression, and is eroding the very foundations of civilization because they're broken ideologies that we still see through. Now, here's the thing. I gave you the extreme view. Again, you're probably not all there, but maybe you're somewhere in there going, actually, I, yeah. And I'm seeing that. You see, marriage is supposed to teach us self-denial, 
But culture teaches us to view marriage through the lens of self-fulfillment. Find somebody where you don't have to deny yourself, but somebody who, who will help you achieve your dreams. It's not a marriage, it's a me-ridge. The second lens that we view uh, marriage through is, is fear. A lot of us are deeply ter- terrified of marriage uh, because maybe you're a product of a divorced home um, or maybe you saw your parents grow up in a loveless marriage and you tell yourself, I don't ever wanna do that. And so uh, many of us, uh, we're afraid to lose our individual freedoms, our personal autonomy, and our personal desires. Uh, it's kind of like a new phenomenon called a dink. Do you guys know what a dink is? It's two couple or two people who are dual income, no kids. Um, kids are an inconvenience. They, they don't want kids. Now, I get that there are people who maybe can't have kids, but this is a, pers- this is a movement that says kids are inconvenient and we don't want kids so we'd rather spend our money and live our life how we want to. Here's the deal, that works really good when you're in 20s and 30s, but when you're 65, 75, and there's nobody at Christmas, it's gonna be really, really lonely. It's a very short-sighted view. Chris Rock once said this, you can either be single or lonely or married and bored. Uh, Chris gives us only two options, but how many of you guys know that there's a deeper option, which is satisfaction in the way God has designed you? Here's the reason I think that many of us are actually really afraid of marriage. Here's the deeper unspoken reason. And that's this. We're afraid of marriage because we know we are flawed. We know deep down that there are some deep things wrong with us and we have really deep needs. And if we get close enough to someone, they will see those flaws, they will see those needs. And not only that, if I have needs and I have flaws, so do they. And to deal with their needs and their flaws while being aware with my, of my needs and my flaws seems too messy and too painful, so I would rather reject the idea of marriage completely. And I will live a life that organizes itself around self-fulfillment, self-actualization, and self-indulgence. So if I want a sexual partner, I can find a sexual partner. If I want some friendship, I can have a friends with benefits. I can keep someone on the line promising them marriage, promising them marriage, and then that lasts two, three, four, five years without ever actually taking the step. The problem with avoiding this and avoiding love is we think we're protecting ourselves. but C.S. Lewis had this really powerful and poignant quote where he says this, to love at all is to be vulnerable. Love anything and your heart will be wrung and possibly broken. Can anybody say amen to that? If you want to make sure of keeping it intact, you must give it to no one, not even an animal. Wrap it up carefully around with hobbies and little luxuries and avoid all entanglements. Lock it up safe in the casket or coffin of your selfishness. But in that casket, safe, dark, motionless, airless, it will change. It will not be broken. It will become unbreakable, impenetrable, irredeemable. To love is to be vulnerable. And so many of us, we're afraid of marriage, and so we avoid it. And the third lens, the third lens is this really preposterous idea of I'm looking for my soulmate, my soulmate, the one. Who's the one for me? I remember I was dating Natalie, and man, she checked all the uh, marks for me, and you know, and I'm gonna talk about that in the coming series of how 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 to identify a good partner. And, uh, I remember I was talking to my dad, and I was like, Dad, man, she's beautiful. She's, she's funny. She's, she loves the Lord. Um, she seems like she's perfect. But, but, Dad, I don't know if she's the one. And, uh, you know, I was really concerned. I, like, I was supposed to have this epiphany where God was like, she's it. Um, <laughs> and because I had heard this idea of a soulmate, and, you know, you, she, the, the one. And my dad said something to me really profound. He goes, she's the one if you decide that she's the one. I mean, he, he said, son, you're looking for a needle in a stack of needles. Uh, a person becomes the one because you decide and commit. You are the one I'm going to love and submit my life to. And surrender my life to. And so we have this lie, and we believe this, that, that if I find the one, 
marriage will just be so great and everything will just fall into place and it's love, it's not supposed to be hard. Come on, if you've been married for five minutes, <laughs> like I told you, marriage is brutal. Uh, but, but really, really, and this is why so many people get divorced. Because they hit, the average is about seven years. Seven years you get into marriage and you go, ooh, you're not who I thought you were. Of course they're not. Marriage changes people. So, so let's go ahead and start with this idea that this, that I meet and fall in love with somebody and it's never supposed to be hard because they're the one and then life is just supposed to be this enchanted romantic story of us just going through the blue bonnets. That is the biggest lie people believe today and, and what do they do? They go from marriage to marriage to marriage to marriage and when it gets hard, they go, oh, you're not the one for me. Let me go in the words of John Mayer and find a better you. Here's the thing. The, the, the problem, the problem with that is God never tells us that we're supposed to search for a soulmate. Someone to complete us. And that's what we're looking for. We're looking for someone to complete the empty spaces of our heart. But the problem with that is we literally crush, crush the person that we think is supposed to be. And then we live in disappointment and frustration. And why are you not emotionally meeting my needs? Why are you not sexually meeting my needs? Why are you not financially? Like, why are you not doing this? And we expect all these things from this partner who is supposed to be so easy. And what's happening is this, is, is you're expecting them to be God. You're placing the weight that Almighty God plays in your life and you're placing on a human and it will crush them because they, they cannot be God to you. And when we look and go, it's supposed to be easy. Ask LeBron James. It looks so easy for you. You must just show up. No, there's hours and hours and hours of discipline. Ask any business person who's built a successful business. You make it look so easy. Was it just easy for you? Did you just have naturally talented business acumen? He's like, no, it was hours and hours of building and building and building. Ask Tiger Woods, right? They're playing the Masters today. It looks so easy, right? He just goes. Hours and hours. Um, good marriage takes blood, sweat, tears, effort, work, and you build something through Christ. It doesn't just happen. You can say amen to that. <laughs> marriage profoundly changes you. The person that you fell in love with is not the same person because they met you. You changed them and they changed you. That's what happens in the context of relationships. No two people are perfectly compatible. Why? We are selfish, neurotic, broken people. And we think that the minute we say I do, all of that changes. Here's what marriage used to be. Marriage used to be a permanent union designed for mutual love, protection, and procreation. Let me say it again if you're a note taker. Marriage used to be, and I believe can be redeemed again according to biblical standards, a permanent union designed for mutual love, protection, and procreation. But it has now been reduced to a temporary sexual contract that if you do not sexually or emotionally fulfill me or am I am not able to pursue my own self-actualization, then you're not the one and I'm going to find somebody else. It's a me, Rich, not a marriage. Marriage was created to be about us. It has become about me. So what's the secret? What's the mystery? In Ephesians chapter five, verse 32, Paul gives us this text. This mystery is profound. He's saying it's, a, it's, a, it's huge. And, and here's what I would say. Um, if you've not been married, you can look in and learn but it's in marriage 
It's in marriage that you learn the secret. It's almost as if God goes, come on, get in here. All right, y'all get together. I do, I do, okay, let's do it. You know, till death do us part. Sickness and health. If you gain 30 pounds, I'm out. <laughs> okay. And he goes, he's almost like this. All right, now I'm going to show you something. What in marriage is God trying to teach us? It's that we are more broken, selfish, and sinful than we ever dared believe. I know your mommy told you you were special, but you're a sinner, and so am I. I'm broken. And marriage will show that to you. Like really, like you get married really quickly, there's this other person that will help you see. <laughs> praise God, praise God, praise God. Okay, this is, the, this is the moment. If you're sitting next to your spouse, you just put your arm around them. Hey, I love you. But this is for you. Listen, 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 right, right, right. In marriage, you quickly realize, oh, oh. And when you come to Jesus, you quickly realize, oh, I'm not worthy to stand in his presence. I'm sinful. And, and if the gospel left you there, how depressing. And if a marriage left you there, which if I'm honest, a lot of our marriages do. That's where we stop. You're this. You're selfish. You're just like your mother. But that's only half the gospel. The other half, and it's a secret. Shh, 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 come in, lean in. Is this, that no matter how broken, sinful, corrupt, selfish you are, you are more loved than you could have ever hoped dreamed or imagined and there is no depth to your depravity that God does not stand there and go I still love you so what is a marriage it's the gospel it's standing in front of your spouse and going yeah you're this 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 and this but I'm not leaving you because I love you and it's in that relationship. Thank you, Isaac. It's, listen, listen, I, I know, I know, I know. I got one minute. I know, I know. Listen, I got, I got to con convey this. And that is the relationship that transforms us. One where you're fully known and fully loved. You see, to love without truth is silly romanticism. It's Disney. And... And to be known but not loved, meaning love without, or excuse me, truth without love, is cold, harsh, and mean. So I don't know where you're at today. And I would say this, if you were the person on the front end of my message who you're not a believer, you're peeking in. Um, I love you, but you're sinful. And you will not save yourself. You're not good enough, you're not smart enough. You're not. I don't care how much money you have. I don't care what your body fat percentage is. I don't care how smart you think you are. You are not good enough. And God loves you. And the only way to life is to truly surrender your life to him and to receive the good news of the gospel. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, I believe that there are people here that are lost sinners. You say, I'm a saved sinner. But you're lost, meaning you've never surrendered your life to Jesus. I want to give you an opportunity on the count of three to lift up your hand and go, I want to step into that gospel. I want to receive the grace of Jesus on my life right now. And if that's you, on the count of three, just slip your hand up. One, two, three. If that's you saying, I need to say yes to Jesus. Yes, hands, hands. 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 Anybody else? Yeah, hand on the right. Praise God. You can put it back down. Thank you. Simply just say this prayer with me. Say, Jesus. Today, I surrender my life to you. Forgive me of my sins because you know all of them. Thank you for loving me. 
Thank you for dying for me and help me to follow you. Today, Jesus, I confess you, Lord, Savior, and King. In Jesus' name, amen. God, I pray over my church, the marriages, the singles, the dating, the engaged. God, the, we're about to quit. God, I pray over these next few weeks, God, I'm not, I'm not a marriage expert, but you are. And God, I just pray that if there are some paradigms this morning that began to shift, Father, I thank you for that. And God, I pray over my church that we would begin to see marriage more clearly the way you designed it to be. And Father, it's going to be hard. It's not fun um, to get into these matters of the heart because it's very vulnerable. It's scary. But God, your grace is sufficient for that. So I pray over these next few weeks that God, we won't skip. God, we won't skip, but we will, God, we will look towards culture and we will face it head on because we go against what culture says because we are people of the kingdom. Give us that strength. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said.